Justice for Menacall. In this episode, it's going to better help you determine is Sergeant Jesse Menacall a police sexual predator or is he the actual victim, a victim of the defund the police movement? We're going to have a special guest on our show today. Her name is Megan. Megan is going to talk about her personal cry for help, her lifestyle as a prostitute, and her lifestyle and connection with accuser number one. We'll let you be the judge. I hope you enjoy this episode. This is Gotham Investigations, and I'm your host, Jeff Giordano. This is True Crime Investigations, and this series, Justice for Menacall. We have a very special guest with with us today. Her name is Megan. Megan, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? Fantastic. So we are actually going to talk about someone who identified herself as victim number one during the sentencing hearing. And she also gave an interview to the media, so we are able to come out with her name. Her name is Molly DaCosta. So where this investigation started with uh, Sergeant Menacall was Molly DaCosta pulled into a storage unit facility across the street from the police station with her girlfriend, her girlfriend Nunes. And Jesse observed this behavior, which was late at night, and it appeared that the storage place was closed. When he stopped the vehicle in a traffic stop, he got the identification of Molly. Molly showed that she was only 17 years old at the time, and the other individual in the passenger seat was actually in her 20s, and Molly identified her as being her girlfriend. So quickly, uh, Jesse, with his police experience, and he has taken down human trafficking rings in the past, saw several pilings of clothing in the back seat, and it appeared that Molly was a runaway, possibly at the time, with this other girl. So he brought her in to the police station across the street for questioning. So little did he know uh, Molly's history and Molly's past, and that's what we're gonna get into today. Uh, The day after he interviewed Molly in the police station, she came out with all kind of accusations, and uh, these accusations included sexual allegations against Jesse Menacall. In the sentencing hearing in the media, she came out praising herself that she finally came out with these allegations that brought other women to come forward. And now we have with us Megan, who was actually her roommate uh, during one period of time. So Megan, when you were- Two periods of time. Two periods of time. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You said two periods of time you were her roommate? Correct. Okay. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? I was born and raised in Miami, Florida. Um, I actually grew up very structured and very secure. I wound up doing things that weren't so approved of within my family, so I wound up leaving myself. I had gotten kicked out. I wound up finding Maylee when I worked at this place called Alorica. It was a call center at the time for DirecTV. And so Nicole and Maylee knew that I was going through a hard time. And they said, look, you know, we'll take you in. That's fine. We'll talk to my mom. Obviously, I did not know that she didn't talk to her mom at the time until it came time for me to move in. And she's like, oh, yeah, I had to lie to my mom and tell her, oh, well, you know, we were planning this. You had already paid up front. And from there, I just started living with her. So just so our viewers know, Nicole is Nicole Nunez. And that was the girl that was in the vehicle with Molly when a traffic stop occurred. So why did you leave your house? I left because I wound up taking money from my own parents and just getting mixed with people that weren't so good. It wasn't a gang, nothing like that. It was just poor choice and friends. And my mom and dad did not approve of it. So therefore, they gave me the choice. Either I wind up, you know, going straight and you know, continuing what I'm doing, but under their constant supervision, or I just had to get out. How old were you at the time? About 20, 22, 23. So did you know Molly or did you know Nicole? Uh, which one brought you into the, I actually, the other one? I actually didn't know either one until I turned about, I think I'd like to say 24. My math sucks, so I'm probably off a bit, but I wound up moving back 
after I left my house, I wound up moving back. Um, I think it was home or something. That I'm not too clear about. But I know that I was going through a rough patch with my own boyfriend. Mary's like, yeah, you know, we're going to go and we're going to get you. We're going to pick you up, just get some clothes. You know, my, my life from like my mid-20s was pretty blurry. So the first time that you met Molly, it's kind of blurry. You don't really recall how you met her? I remember I was working in Alorica. And I was just freaking out because I couldn't pay rent. You know, I was doing what I could working wise, but it's still like I wasn't meeting ends. So Maylee did tell me and so did Nicole. Actually, Nicole was the first one that approached me. You know, she made me comfortable. I started talking to her and she's like, oh, yeah, my girlfriend has this room for rent. And I'm like, oh, well, who's your girlfriend? So that way I could at least talk to her as an adult and well, no, she doesn't like to talk to anybody, but she has a room friend. Oh, technically, it's inside of her parents, um, inside of her mom's place. So I'm like, so isn't that a room for rent that her mom is renting out? So she's like, no, it's her mom's not renting it out. It's Maylee because the name is under Maylee. Lights, water, everything is under Maylee's name. So I'll talk to her and see about getting you. As long as you can come up, I think it was like $500 at the time. As long as I can come up with an amount to pay, you know, I would have that room for rent. I had no problem with it for the fact that I, I make money and legally, of course, um, I was working and I know to save up just in case of anything. So therefore, when it came to Maylee, she's like, oh, no, Nicole never told me any of this. And then they both got together and Nicole's like, yeah, I told you. She's like, oh, that's the girl you're talking about. I thought it was somebody else. And so from there, we all spoke, we got together. And that's when they said, yeah, you know, that's fine. Let me just talk to my mom. We'll see about getting you in. And from what I knew, the mom was okay with it until I had wound up actually paying, moving in, and then wound up finding out that the person that had moved in was supposedly kicked out. Um, and that she left all her bag of clothes and all clothes and everything in there. Like, it, the room was basically still lived in. And this is at uh, Hidden Grove Apartments? No, it was before then. It was, it before. was at her mom's house. At her mother's house. Okay. Um, a lot of the information that we're going to give out today is, just so you know, is not from the discovery. These are from separate public records requests that were made through the Hialeah Police Department. But during the course of our investigation, uh, Molly... De Costa was given complete immunity, which means basically on all depositions and all her statements, she could basically come out and lie and make up allegations against Jesse to move forward, and she wouldn't be prosecuted for perjury. The only reason that you would do that to any victim is obviously, number one, bring them to the table if you want to talk to them. Maybe they have a history of criminal activity themselves, and they would be afraid to come forward to, to talk. So part, part of the state attorney's office or what the feds do is they'll bring them forward, they'll clean up their record, and any pending charges they'll have dropped, and then they will know that they could speak freely, even coming up with lies if necessary, if they had to about Jesse, and they wouldn't be prosecuted or, or, or held accountable for their actions. She's made a habit of that. So one of the things that um, she mentioned in several internal affairs interviews was her mother uh, attempted suicide on several occasions. Was her mother an alcoholic that you were aware of? A when I used drug to, dealer, a druggie, or what? No. When I used to live there, her mom wasn't in the best of health. She would occasionally have drinks, but nothing to where it... Honestly, even with me, because I know alcoholism, again, not an alcoholic or anything, but, like, I know when people are, you know, alcoholics and such, her mom, it was rare for me to ever see her drinking. The most she would drink is water, or soda. Her mom would take me along with her when she would go to grocery shopping. She would never, ever, that I know of, she never once went, oh, here's a bottle of some type of, you know, alcohol. Never once. She got food. She was very motherly and nurturing. Maylee, I know she used to smoke weed, or sorry, marijuana. She used to smoke marijuana. Her mom didn't like it. Her mom, for a fact, used to talk to me and open up to me and tell me she never liked Nicole, Nicole Nunez. That Nicole Nunez would, never got a good feeling about her. She wasn't a good person. That ever since meeting Nicole, 
Meili's life wound up. Uh, it's a word in Spanish, but the term, and excuse my language, is her life basically wound up going to shit. Okay. And and what year was this that you were becoming her roommate? Lorca was around, I think it was before 2014, because I know that her mom wound up kicking her out eventually, and she even lied to her mom when she was kicked out. Okay, so when you moved in, you said that the room was full of clothing. For the How long clothing, did that last when you moved in with her? Oh, I'd like to say, let me think, a few months, if that. Then I wound up moving out and living with a boyfriend who he also wasn't a good person, and I wound up leaving. I actually um, asked my dad to pick me up, and I wound up packing my stuff and just getting the heck out of there. So during the few months that you were with Molly, did you ever move back in with her after that or just that short No, time it was that short period of time and then her mom wound up kicking her out. I actually had a Bank of America account that Maylee wound up going on to Bank of America and saying that I was basically play, playing as if she was me saying, oh, my name is Megan so-and-so and I have fraud on my account. You know, you need to get this. She knew how to talk to people. She knew how to finesse people and talk to them. She would say, oh, there's fraud on my account. And then what they would do is on their end, I don't know how banks do it, but they disputed it, went back and forth. I got the money back. So you were in, involved in uh, drugs yourself a little bit, correct? Unfortunately, I was. I was going through my own mental health struggles and my own life struggles to where I unfortunately wound up allowing and I take responsibility for it as well but I wound up allowing what others did influence me and affect me okay and you were also involved in prostitution at the time at the time it was in 2014 I believe and yeah I was that was at the time of Hidden Grove Apartments that was honestly when I wound up getting off of social security disability and at that time, I had paid for my stay living there. I actually just lived on a couch. I didn't have any type of way to have my own personal belongings there. And just as she did before, her and Nicole wound up bringing me in, saying, oh, don't worry, we're going to kick this person out. You can have their room. So uh, just for, so our viewers know, Hidden Grove Apartments uh, had a lawsuit against Molly DaCosta to evict her because she wasn't paying her rent at the time. And we're talking about the years now, 2014, 2015, where Molly on several interviews says herself, she attempted to commit suicide several times on several occasions. Do you recall that? No. Okay. And that's within, on several interviews. Within the apartment, no. I do happen to know that there was, she had one, two, three. three. Was she Baker acted, do you know? No, I was, I was the one that was Baker acted. And again, I was also the one that had, that went through many suicide attempts. So if anything, knowing how Maylee is, knowing how she tends to lie and use other people's life stories to benefit herself, I can tell you, if I know more or less what the um, occurrences were, I could tell you a few of them were me. Um, I do happen to know, however, that... There was one incident where she started seizing up and they did not allow me to call the police. I'm like, dude, she's here seizing up. I was freaking out, although trying to remain calm. She was on her stomach seizing. There was, I don't know if it was an act or not. There was water around her, but then again, she had just went into the shower and it wasn't water as in, um, it wasn't water as in like saliva or anything. It was more like, if I had the water bottle and I just poured it there and lied on the floor. But, you know, me, she, she tended to, I wound up getting close to her. So when she did stuff like that, it tended to pull on my heartstrings and I felt bad. So I wound up screaming out to the other roommates, hey, you've got to call the police. You need to call the police. She's seizing up. She could die if we just leave her here. Never once did anybody want to call the police, nothing. I wound up actually, um, I don't know if I wound up calling the police or my parents or someone, but I know I called someone. I was freaking out. And I also happened to know that I turned her on her side, asked either her girlfriend or someone to get me a spoon 
to place in her mouth just so that way she wouldn't bite her tongue. And one of the roommates was like, no, just leave her, leave her. If she's going to drown, she's going to soak in her own vomit or whatever, let her. She's just acting. She's pulling an act. And I'm like, well, if this is an act or not, I don't care. This is really scary. And if she comes out of it and she's fine, great. But I don't want her, whatever's going on, I don't want it resting on my conscience. Did you ever see her do drugs? I I saw her do marijuana, smoke marijuana. She would do hookah. She would drink like a fiend. Um, she was actually the alcoholic, which is pretty scary to say. Um, she would throw parties in Hidden Grove apartments. Like her and her girlfriend had this huge speaker that they used to hook up to their car. It was a white Nissan Altima. They hooked up a huge speaker to it, and I guess they had to take out the speaker. So they would throw major parties, and I was... At the time, I couldn't stand it, so I just wound up either going with one of my roommates for, like, drives and stuff to clear my head or just walking around. How did you get involved in prostitution? That was one where I think we were all having a conversation, just getting to know each other, opening up, because us as roommates, there were one, two, one, two, three, four, five, five to seven roommates. All girls? No. One was, it was Maylee and her girlfriend, um, Nicole. Another one that was an older woman, her name, is it okay to say her name? Of course. Her name was Alisa Cross. Then her boyfriend is Alisa Cross and Troy or LaTroy. I don't remember his last name. I know that he used to work for something like waste wise or he was trying to clean up his act so that he would do a community service and then there was michael michael starts with a d and it's not the costa but i know there was a guy named michael he was gay and then maylee's cousin was named aaron and he wound up living with us a little bit like not too long after so when you were recruited for prostitution, who recruited you? It was more of a whole open conversation. And at that time, I was very tense, just like kind of how I am now. And in order to get me to relax and ease up, they offered me drinks. Maylee and her and her girlfriend offered me drinks. Um, they also told me to smoke. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to mix drinking with smoking. If I have a drink, I have a drink. If I'm smoking, I'm smoking. But um, Maylee tended to be that one that was very aggressive. And here, you're going to smoke and put it like right in front of my face. At that point, I'm just like, she wouldn't let up. And I'm like, you know what? I've already smelled it. I, you know, there's nothing else I could do and she won't let up. This is me thinking wise. And so I wound up smoking. And then that's when they obviously knew that that's how they could get to me. And they wound up recruiting me. Oh, well, since you're not able to pay your rent and since you had just come off of social security and she did it in a way to finesse oh well since you're not you know able to pay your rent now and you're not this and that and you just got off of social security you know why don't you just think about selling yourself and at that moment like I kid you not I probably gave her a death stare because that's one thing that never crossed my mind ever and I'm like, no, no, I'd rather get a job instead of, you know, selling myself. And then she wound up talking to me. Well, technically it is a job. You're making money and you're working for yourself. You have your own hours, this and that. And again, I didn't say yes immediately. But then when she started doing it and I saw her making money and she would basically just throw it in my face. And I'm like, you know what? Fine, fine. I'll do it. Just once to try it out. And then if I don't like it. We never speak about it again. I never do it again. Well, that one time, honestly, I did not like it. She wound up getting me to smoke again. And after smoking, she was like, so you liked it, huh? I go, no, I didn't like it. I felt dirty. Like I literally had to shower about three to four times and I still felt disgusting. And so then it got to that to where... um, Even after that, she's like, yeah, but look, you made good money. And then she wound up recruiting somebody else to do it, uh, Alisa Cross. 
and it just wound up to be where it's like don't worry we'll protect you nobody's gonna hurt you this and that you can smoke you could do whatever I know people in the police I know this I know that if you ever get in trouble don't worry we'll get you off now my first fear and concern was honestly not about getting in trouble at all it was more of I wasn't comfortable with it I wound up telling them look I'm not okay with it I'm not comfortable with it I'm not gonna do it anymore even when smoking and they're like no no just take a few more puffs it's gonna be okay you'll be fine and I'm like okay smoke just to be able to calm myself down and because at that point I was like literally shivering I had never known what an anxiety attack or a panic attack was but I could tell you that the time that I was with her I realized what a panic attack, anxiety attack, and all of that was. So I told them no. They're like, okay, fine. You don't have to do it. It's fine. And then they wound up saying, oh, you have another client, though. And when they told me that, I'm like, what are you talking about, another client? I said no. I wasn't into it anymore. I'm not comfortable. I'm not doing it. So basically, me being direct, it still flew over deaf ears. So I was just like, I'm not doing it. I'm not, I'm not comfortable. So at that point, they're like, well, if we have you advertised here that you're doing it, so you didn't take it offline. I'm like, first off, I never made the ad. If I made the ad, it would be strict to the T. It would pretty much be legal. And I know that prostitution is not legal, which is what you're doing and what you're getting me to do. Like, they basically used my disability and used me to be to think that I was dumb and I wasn't. I had had enough and I told them that. And at that point, they're like, no, no, keep going. It got to the point that I actually, the only way that I personally knew how to get out of it was to, if I wasn't going to get help by reaching out for help, it was just to actually commit suicide. It's like I wasn't going to get out of it unless I died. By the way, I could tell that you're a little nervous talking about this. We thank yeah. you for that. And that's the only way you can get this stuff off your shoulders is uh, confronting your fears and, and confronting and getting out the demons inside of you. So how many guys have you had sex with during that time when they were prostituting you out to, uh, was it men and women or just men? No, it was just men. And they had asked me, do you want men and women or just men? And this was at the time that they got me so high that you could have told me the sky is purple and I would have believed you. Um, but honestly, that I know of, because one thing that I knew, that one of my roommates actually wound up, even though she was in it as well, she wound up kind of helping me out and take me under her wing in the sense of keep a track, keep a record, because this girl, I don't like her. She's very sketchy. If you want to get out of it, I would say, yeah, go for it, get out of it. And I didn't know what out of it was. She was the roommate that we had was pretty mysterious as well. And she didn't want to, you know, be the one to like she was helping me out. She had that good. She this person had a soul. She has a soul. The only thing was that she was trying what she was doing. She knew wasn't right either. She was in a hard time as well. But she's like, if you want to get out, you have to do it this way. And she's like, don't be around Maylee. Just hang around us. And I wound up doing that, just hanging around that person, which was Elisa Cross and her boyfriend or fiancé at the time. But then I realized the more she hung around Maylee, she's like, don't worry about it. I'm headstrong. I got this. You know I'm taking you under my wing. We're going to get out. We're going to get you out of this. Don't worry. And she would always tell me, don't worry about me. I'm ready. I am who I am. I'm here I'm doing what I'm doing so she didn't really care about herself but to get me out like that's one thing that I appreciate from her because she's like just let me hang around Maylee I could talk to her I'm not gonna say anything I'm pretty mysterious around her she's not gonna mess with me she already knows plus I'm bigger than her so I'm like okay that's fine but then what I noticed is the more she hung around Maylee the more of an influence even though Maylee was young the more of an influence she had around Elisa and she would start telling her, oh, yeah, you can get into this, too. Look how much we make. We wound up providing this whole house, this and that, which technically was an apartment. But she's like, yeah, I have this car because of that, this and that. So she was, again, doing what she did to me, to Elisa. And they never once let us both get together at the same time. 
So Alisa and I had to go behind Maylie's back if we wanted to get anything done, do anything right. It was basically just behind Maylie's back to the point that Alisa had noticed there were, if you could really count it, I would consider Alisa more of the accountant of the whatever was going on because I still had no idea. Like I basically turned a blind eye to it and I was just like, I'm just here because I need a place to stay. So Even if it was a ballpark a figure, on. how many men are we talking about that you slip, slept oh, with yeah. that they pimped Going you back out to. to that question, it honestly wasn't many. It was, it made enough. It made like about 350, whereas Maylee and I think Elisa and not Nicole, but um, yeah, it made like Maylee and, and um, Elisa, it made them thousands. Me, I wasn't okay with it. And the one thing that I started figuring out I can't even say how much because it wasn't enough to count on one hand or two hands. So did you have to pay them money? I mean, why would they be so interested in for you to continue being on this website and pimping because, you out for sex? Because what benefit they, would it be for them? They learned that after posting my picture, once with makeup and once without makeup, the guys didn't care. Like they just were drawn to me naturally. And she's like, wait a minute. I remember you telling me something um, that guys like you. I'm like, yeah, guys like me. Girls like me too. Everybody likes me. And she's like, wait a minute. Okay, well, that's fine. That's fine. And walked away. And then now thinking about it, she used my, I had a confidence. I had a sexuality. I was very confident in who I was. And she used it against me because men, no matter who it was, they were drawn to me. And I was the type of person that's like, you know, that guy's checking you out. They like you. I'm like, okay, that's great. They can check me out all they want. I'm still not going to get with them. And so she wound up using little tidbits that I told her to her benefit. Did she benefit money-wise from you? Oh, yeah. She so was the one that was holding the money. And Elisa, I could honestly say, which she was a roommate, um, she wound up, I guess you can say, being the bookkeeper because she had a receipt book and that was only for um, rental purposes, but it was more so that um, Maylee would take the money and once it hit $350, which was my rent at the time because it wound up going down just because of the fact that I spoke to them and I'm like, I'm living on a couch. Why am I going to pay $400, $500 to live on a couch? I don't even have any privacy. I don't have anything. I'm literally like, this is as close to homeless as I could get. If you were to put that couch out there and say, hey, you're sleeping there on the couch, I'd probably do that too. But um, so when it came down to it, the other roommate was like the bookkeeper in a way. Maylee was the one that always held the money. She had her own personal little safe. And the thing that we started noticing, and that's when I was like, that's when I actually started snapping out of this whole game that she was playing, was that Maylee started missing money. And I started piecing things together. She would go off when she was missing money and, oh, Nicole, you stole it, or this person stole it. And I'm like, you're the only one that had the money. Hey, you want more money? That's fine. But I guarantee you, I'm going to find a job. I'm not going to keep putting myself out there. I actually was probably the only one that was very adamant at the time of, if I'm going to do this, which I really don't like to, again, she pulled on my heartstrings. And I was just like, if I'm going to do this, no matter what, I require protection. And at the time, they thought protection is in guns and stuff. I'm like, no, 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 no. For that, I'll call the police. I said that, and this girl flipped out. I'm like, no, I mean protection as in, um, like, condoms and such. And they better have, like, drug tests or whatever type of test, because if not, I'm not doing it. And so Maylee, again, made me feel comfortable, and I was there being reassured and said, okay, that's fine, we'll get protection, we'll do this, we'll do that. But she basically, now looking back on it, used my sexuality, used who I was and how I am to her benefit. And she was the one that always kept the money. So when you mentioned protection, did they say, don't worry, we have guns, we could protect you? 
she actually did. I think it was Nicole that wound up saying that at one point. That, oh, look, I have a lockbox. In the lockbox, I have a gun. If you want, I'll pull it down and you can see. I'm like, no, no, I don't need to see a gun. I don't want to see a gun. Thank you. But that's not the protection that I mean. I meant just, and I started laughing just like I'm doing now. It's like, I actually just mean condoms. Yeah, gun is fine. I really hope nobody would need a gun drawn on them. Like, that's ridiculous. It's just sex. Like, I honestly was new to it. And I didn't know anything about anything. So I'm like, I would hope that nobody would need a gun drawn on them. And then I started overthinking. But, um, yeah, they mentioned guns. They had mentioned... What else was it? They mentioned guns. They did mention the because I had said the safe. I'm like, I better safe than sorry. I want a condom. It was guns. They had mentioned that Troy was going to be there. Um, he was going to be posted in his car, or posted nearby. And they're like, they won't mess with him because he's black. I'm like, my first thought was just like, okay, well, black, white, doesn't matter who you are. If somebody's going to mess with you, they're going to mess with you. Do you know if uh, Molly ever had sex with men herself? Yeah, she did. She did many times. She used to say, when she was around Nicole, she used to say that she didn't like it. When she wasn't around Nicole, she didn't care who you were. Because some of Nicole's statements were that she wouldn't have sex with men, and she came out saying that they would rob their individuals that they would get off of these websites. One of the websites was providerphone.com and another one was Backpage. Are you familiar with Backpage? I'm familiar with Backpage and I refuse to go on it. But then again, due to Maley and Nicole, they had already posted me on it without my consent. And at that point, I'm like, well, it's already up. There's not really much we can do to take it down because if you take it down, it's already out there. This was some of the things that they posted. I'm Jess. Let me show you the time of your life. I'm beautiful, independent, and love to have fun. I'm 23 years old. That was her girlfriend, Nicole, at the time was 23 years old. Mm -hmm. But they have pictures of both of them having sex with, with, with each other. Italian Cuban. I'm that sweet, sexy girl next door. I am to please. Don't they, hesitate. Call me now. And then, like that, there's several they used posts to tell that they put. There were a lot of things that they told me in confidence that when you read that, yeah, that was one of those things that they had told me and they were they would laugh about it afterwards. Oh, ha, ha, ha. We get off this and that. And they would actually confide in me. And I mean, I don't mind. Anybody can confide in me. As I tell anybody, I don't judge anyone. I haven't had the best past either. And so they used to tell me things like that. They wound up, I think it was at one page, showing me an old phone or something or showing me their ad. And I looked in the call and I'm like, Italian, Cuban, girl, you can you can pass as a Cuban, but definitely not an Italian. And then she's like, what do you mean? And she would grab this like scarf. I think it was like plaid or something at the time. Um, and she's like, look, I just put this on and a nice coat and I prop myself up and now I look Italian. I'm like... Yeah, to somebody who doesn't know what an Italian looks like, maybe. But you definitely don't look Italian at all. And so it's like they would laugh about the things that they did to others. And I wasn't proud of what I did to them. But when it comes down to it, I just wound up making fun of them for it. Because my whole thing is you shouldn't bully someone without getting that, you know, without getting it back. So you mentioned earlier you wanted out and you thought the only way out was suicide. Yeah. Did it you actually, ever try to commit suicide? Yes. Inside of their apartment, I wound up drinking bleach. I wound up, it, it wasn't, it was a lot to where I started actually choking and I was drive heaving. I was throwing up. Um, I had, had gastric bypass surgery like in 2013. So at the time, um, my body was already done with the gastric bypass surgery. I was fine. I was in good health. But I was dry heaving to the point that I started bleeding. Like I would spit up blood and I would get freaked out. Um, Maylee at the time had friends over. One of her friends screamed out, she needs milk. And they all started laughing. And that was at the time that I don't know what happened 
I don't know what caused me to think that the only way I'm getting out was to commit suicide, but I just know that I wound up just, I wound up taking a lot of alone time away from Maylee and away from Nicole and everyone in that place to where I just stayed very quiet. Like it got to the point that I never once spoke to them. I would go out with them. Um, the only one that I would more or less talk to but learn not to talk to too much was to Elisa. And so when it got down to it, for some reason in my mind, I just started piecing things together. Everything from when I lived with her before to when I stayed with her again. And I'm like, holy crap. And then when I saw you um, tell on the, the board saying that, you know, they may have been in a gang it's like that's the one thing that came back to me because before I tried to commit suicide, just piecing it together, figuring out it all out, I got scared and I was like, holy crap, I'm in a gang. Like, this is the only reason that makes sense as to why police won't go to Meili, as to why if somebody's calling out for help, they'll go to the people downstairs, they'll go to the people next door, doesn't matter who it is. But if we really wanted to get police in or anything, we had to be outside. And the first thing that I thought was, holy crap, this is a gang. And from what I just know, based off of watching TV programs, based off of even like just looking at police officers and just that common sense knowledge that I have is there's no way to really get out. You either get out by... It's literally in a gang. It's just you get out by death. Either you get um, killed. It's basically kill or be killed. And obviously I knew I did not want to be killed. And I'm like, at this point, I know myself. I know that if I attempt suicide, I'm not going to fully go through with it. Just for the fact that I was raised Catholic. I believe suicide is the worst thing to ever do. But then also I knew that in attempting suicide, it's a cry for help. And therefore I would get the, the treatment that I needed. I would get out and I would be able to talk to someone. And it wound up that I still wasn't as confident. I was still, I still knew that the moment that I got out of the hospital, I'd go straight back to where I was, in which case I could possibly be killed. So you were hospitalized from drinking the bleach? Mm-hmm. Who called fire rescue for you? I think it was, from what I was told, it was Elisa. Although that I'm not, I don't know if it really was Elisa or if it was my parents. Because I wound up telling my parents that I drank bleach. Did and they baker act you? Yeah, they baker acted me. Um, I was, I have a feeling though, it possibly was my mom she probably freaked out, called Elisa, because I think Elisa wound up having my mom's number. And so um, it was either my mom, knowing how she is, she will go off on you until something gets done. Or it was just my mom called and Elisa took credit for it. But um, either way, I wound up getting Baker acted a day later. And Maylee was there, and I was there crying, going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for what I did, I'm so sorry. I was freaking out. Maylee was there, just not caring, arms folded, and pretending to cry, which she normally does, going like this, fix, and she said, I'm not crying, I'm just fixing my eyelashes. Always had an excuse for something. The moment you called her out on something was the next moment that she started to make, or the next moment that she made an excuse. So um, I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She's like, no, it's fine, that's fine. Don't worry, it's not, I'm not upset at you. I'm not mad. I'm like, I know you're not, but for what I did, I'm sorry, it's not. I know you don't like the police being called. And she's like, well, the police aren't here. They're downstairs. They're, they already know they're not allowed to come up here. So when you were Baker acted, they held you for 48 hours. That's the minimum uh, standard That is the standard, minimal pro standard pro yeah, protocol. Did that's you the standard protocol. I think I wound up... Um, staying there for 72 hours um it may have been a little longer again it's all it's kind of fuzzy like date wise but I remember um picture wise I remember who was there it's like my memory runs differently than others I don't, uh, did you tell a psychiatrist why you attempted to commit suicide about the prostitution and how I you didn't. felt that, that was, was your only way out 
I was so quiet and so um, from I was I like to say it was post traumatic stress disorder because I was so withdrawn, so out of it to where they had asked me, did you do drugs? And the one thing that I freaked out on, and I didn't say it though, was I'm like, no, no, I didn't. And I'm sure they knew because they ran blood tests because some of the things were more elevated than others. And it's like, you know, they have experience as well. But when it came down to it, I was just so withdrawn and so freaked out and scared that I was just like, you know what? I'm just going in to get the help that I need. That's basically it. I'll come out, I'll pack my stuff, and I'll leave. And it wound up the way that I wanted it to go, the way that I planned it to go, was not the way that it happened. So I wound up staying there. But then again, apparently my suicide attempt scared Elisa so badly that she's like, don't worry, we're not going to put you on back page anymore. You're not doing it. You could beg me. You can ask me, hey, I need some money. Can I please be on back page? I'm like, believe me, that's going to be the last thing that I ask you is if I need money to be on back page. No, mm -mm. nope. So Alisa was the one that wound up not posting or anything. Um, and then Maylee wound up, she said she had a job, but I could tell she was lying. I just, I knew how she was. I had spent so much time with her in the past that I knew her for what she was. And I was the only one to call her out on her BS. So when you got out after being Baker Acted, you went back to the house with Molly? Mm-hmm. She wasn't there at the time. I had even asked my roommate, hey, is Maylee there? And she's like, no, she's not here. She went to work. Or I guess I think it's work. And so I'm like, okay. So I'm like, good. If she's there, just please tell her to walk by me. Don't talk to me. Don't say anything. So was that your only cry for help? That one time drinking bleach? Or did you attempt that uh, cry for help on other occasions? I believe I did it multiple times. It was I tried to drown myself inside of a bathtub full of water. Um, well, that's certainly a clean way to go. How, <laughs> how, how far did that uh, go? I mean, it went as far as my heart started. Um, like, I don't know how to exactly explain it, but it's like my heart started jumping to where it's like, wake up. Hello, get, get out. And did you I, take something to knock yourself out or you just no, like went I under just and held submerged and held my breath. And at that point, it's like my life flashed before my eyes. I saw my mom. I saw my dad. I saw just the hurt. And I saw everything. And I was like, no, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to go. And it's like near-death experience really changed me. Because at the same time, I felt like I saw my guardian angel. And she just told me, you're not ready to go. It's not your time. And then I started doing research um, when I was, after I had gotten out of it, out of the bathtub, I just surfaced and I started taking lots of deep breaths. But um, I was to the point where um, I started researching and looking up the effects of suicide and or attempted suicide and such. And I not only saw the effects that it does to um to the person but it's like something clicked in my mind to where it was like it doesn't just affect the people that you're living with it affects your family it affects the people in the long run and at that moment I knew I'm like I needed a way to get out obviously if it wasn't by suicide I was gonna get out some other way to where I was at that point begging my mom, please, please take me back. Find me a place to stay, something. I don't care where it is. I don't care if it's a halfway house. I don't care what it is. And then my dad wound up telling me, you know that a halfway house is for people that have a problem, right? Like they have an addiction or they're coming out of um, jail or something. I'm like, oh, okay then, never mind. Not going to a halfway house, a homeless shelter something please and the homeless shelters at the time they had a list and it was just going to take too long so at that point I wound up just staying put and I kept changing my mind as well like no it's okay I'll stay put I don't have to deal with them anymore you know I was already promised that I don't have to do this anymore 
And for a, honestly, for a while after my suicide attempts, I didn't. I didn't have to do it. And I finally felt relieved. I'm like, finally, like, I don't, I don't have to do this anymore. Great. Awesome. I could live here. I could pay my rent could do whatever and then it wound up when Maylee and, and um, Nicole wound up having a problem again it was about money and the first person they dragged into it as always was me I got so tense I'm like why can't you just get Michael or Elisa or something to do it oh no because they don't make as much it takes a while and Michael Michael's gay nobody's gonna want to do anything with the gay guy so anytime they had a problem they would come to me they would throw me in the middle of their problems, and I didn't like it. But at the same time, since they helped me out and I saw that as a kindness, I wound up um, about once or twice, and I told them, just for $60 because you need to pay your phone bill, and that's it. But So when you say just for $60, are you talking about oral sex, regular sex? At the time, it was just oral sex. Well, not even, no, not true, because I refused to do oral sex. I told them, I don't mind doing a hand job here and there. That's fine. If it's to pay a phone bill, fine. But um, Mady obviously did not advertise that. She said that they could do whatever they wanted for 60 minutes. And at that point, I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. This is not what's going to happen. So it's like I felt that they were trying to pull me back in. And I'm like, at that point, I said, no. Um, Alisa did wind up taking me out and telling me, don't worry about it. I know her game. Now that I really see it's been proven to me what she's like and what's going on, you know, between you and I, there was a jigsaw and we just clicked it together. I'm like, I kind of chuckled. I'm like, well, yeah, you pieced it together. Okay. But all right. All right. Cause I didn't, I'm not one that likes problems. So I didn't want any problems with her too. So she like, don't worry. Anytime they want you to do something, just ask us to take you for a drive. Tell, tell us you need to get some air, you need to clear your head, something. And so that's what wound up happening. Anytime there was a ping on the phone where they wanted me to do something, Alisa was like, hey, Megan, do you want to go grocery shopping? You want to go here? I'm like, yeah, 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 that's fine. Great, come on. And then at that point, I think Maylee started catching on as well. So she's like, oh, no, Elisa, don't worry. We need Megan here. She needs to do something. And then it got into the, ter- the fact that Elisa never left. She's like, don't worry. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to be behind the door. I can hear everything that goes on. Because there was a closet. Uh, Maylee's closet was pretty full at the time. Bags, diapers, you name it. It she had it and she was one that was a master con man or con woman i should say so, so molly had kids what what was no, the diapers for she did not have kids she wound up um i think it was getting wick or getting some type of benefits because she claimed that she had a kid and anytime a dcf person came over to check because i'm sure they it my first thought was dcf wouldn't come over if there was not a red flag on a person or if there wasn't some type of issue. So, um, DCF, uh, just so our viewers know, is Department of Children's and uh, Families. Mm-hmm. And they usually deal with uh, family members when there's a child involved. Yes. So, um, Maylee wound up having one box of Pampers. And she actually used one of her friends. This at the time was, I don't know how many best friends she has. But um, she was one of her many best friends that actually had a kid, she used their kid to get benefits. She used it to do whatever. So she would have a box of diapers, some some um, formula, some... It was actually never formula. It was bottles, it was diapers, um, and other kid stuff. And she would tell DCF, oh, yeah, no, my child is in daycare right now. And she would have her friend provide the daycare information. She would have just a lot. And it shocked me to where I was like, I actually wound up calling the DCF number and reporting it anonymously that this woman does not have a child. She's a lesbian. And the DCF worker told me, well, that's lesbians can still have kids. I'm like, yeah, I understand that. I know. But I'm telling you right now, she doesn't have a child. 
she sells herself she sells her food stamps for money you name it she does it at the time again it went on deaf ears because i was only one person and nobody really listens to one person so this is pretty much what we talk about a broken system a uh, broken system meaning that the feds had tunnel vision going after jesse to the point where the state attorney's office even gave immunity to, to Molly, where yeah. all of these things with uh, uh, pretending that she has a child, stealing money from the government, uh, the real victim in this whole thing, uh, I think, is sitting right next to us here. You know, uh, several suicide attempts, being forced back into uh, prostitution. It's, it's just a tragic story, and I could see that uh, tears came to your eyes when you started uh, telling us about your uh, cry for helps. Yeah. Uh, tears came to my eyes and I've been a police officer for 30 years. But when you hear these stories and, and how people and, and young women at the time, how old were you at the time? I was in my 20s. In the 20s are just drawn into this uh, criminal element and feel that there's no way out. And they turn to drugs. They turn to alcohol. Uh, and in this case, they, they turn to uh, suicide. So when did you finally realize and say enough is enough? The moment that I realized enough is enough was the time that even Alisa, one of the other roommates, she was older, like 40 something, I think. But the more and more her and I hung out and the less time that Maylee and Nicole, you know, had around us was the more time that we realized this isn't for us. We need to get the hell out of here. And even, you know, they, Troy was normally sit it post it up but that's not because he was watching for Maylee or he was doing anything no he was there because he was on his phone he had calls to make he had other things to do they technically weren't in that life Maylee and Nicole actually dragged them into it just like she did with me and the one thing that freaked me out was I'm like but you're a 40 something year old woman how could she drag you into this and even um Alisa even Alisa had told me, oh, she has her ways. Doesn't matter who you are, you'll still get dragged into it. That's like if I promise you, you're going to get a house, you're going to get this, you know, you're going to do it. And I'm like, yeah, you know what, that's true. But, um, so, so it when just, did you leave? We wound up leaving, I think, before, I think about a month or so before she want, before Hayden Grove wound up kicking her out or evicting her. We saw the eviction notices on the door. We told Maylee about it. Oh, that's fine. Don't worry about it. I'll pay for it. I'll get someone to pay for it. So this was in 2015, more or less. Yes. Um, that's the same time when uh, Jesse Menicol stopped her in a traffic stop. Did she ever mention anything about Sergeant Menicol at the time? No. At the time, she, I have to actually, I can't say no. I have to think about our conversations but I know that for a fact, she used to, she used, she's had a vendetta against police even before she ran in with, to Jesse Menacol. And why did she have a vendetta against police officers? I honestly don't know why. I think one wound up stopping her and Nicole. She told me this many times that, um, and this was before I wound up moving back in with her. A police officer wound up stopping her. And the same way that Jesse had stopped her, this other police officer stopped her, but they let her go. And Nicole had told me, and at the time, my ex-boyfriend, or he was my boyfriend at the time, Nicole had told us, oh, yeah, but that's because they didn't know that um, we were actually going somewhere to, I don't know what it was, but I know that she had promised a police officer something. And I'm like, what the hell can you offer a police officer that they don't already have? But I said nothing. I stayed quiet. And it was at that time, Maylee had offered them sex. So that way she could get released. And then I don't know if the police officer had taken it or not. Wait. I'm, I'm here thinking back to what she said. That was her vendetta. That the police officer never, ever accepted sex. He never accepted a bribe. And she was pissed about that, and so was Nicole. They had had a huge argument. They broke up. You know, they were just 
going off on each other, fighting nonstop. And she was pissed that the police officer didn't want her. He didn't like her. She's like, I'm pretty. I'm this. I'm like, yes, Maylee, you're pretty. You're a very beautiful girl. But police officers aren't going to accept bribes. They're not going to accept sex to get you off. They know that that's unethical. And Maylee wasn't hearing it. She didn't have it. And she said that she had gotten arrested the first time when she was around, I don't know what age. She just said she was young. And that was the first time she had gotten kicked out with her um, from her mom's place. And that she was always back and forth. So she did have some type of vendetta against them. She actually wound up taking me to one of the police precincts. Or at least what she told me was a police precinct. She's like, yeah, I'm going to, this is my attorney. I'm going to have, I'm going to have this person's badge. And then if anybody else messes with me, I'm going to have their badge too. The person that you're referring to there, obviously, is uh, Jesse uh, Menicol. Uh, she had a civil uh, lawsuit against the city of Hialeah, which, you know, during our course of investigation, we truly believe that her motivation was uh, money. As uh, you said, she was eventually uh, kicked out, uh, evicted from uh, Hidden Grove Apartments. Uh, she had a lawsuit against her for the eviction at the time and just uh, carried on and on. We have financial documents and records that show that she was in financial ruins at the time. She and was, I, do- sorry to interrupt, but just to let you know, she was um, at this charade or game or whatever they had called it before. Um, she was doing this way before she hit 17. Did you, when you left, did you, when did you finally go to uh, your parents, a halfway house, a homeless shelter? I wound up actually going to a hotel. It was called the Ramada Inn. Who paid for that? It was saved up between um, Alisa and I. Alisa, Alisa and me mainly were the ones that had saved up. Troy put in his part as well. And then we felt bad for Michael. He was gay. He was actually one that was very innocent as well. And he was just a go with the flow type of person. Yeah, I'll do this. I'll go with you. I don't care. But all of us, the fact that all of us got together and we realized Maylee's not a good person and neither is Nicole. And when those two are together, in Michael's words, he, was, he used to say, shit, bitch, I don't want to be around them. And it's true. Like we all got that notion that when they're both together, they don't care about anybody's life. They would rather see drama and chaos and cause just a lot of damage to people than to actually help them out. Did they look for you after? Did they try to get you back? That I know of, they didn't look for me. However, I do know that um, Maylee sometimes would message me. Oh, hey, how are you doing? Trying to be all nonchalant and I'm, I never replied to her. I actually wound up changing my number. Um, when I had saved up and left with Elisa, we did bring... Um, we did bring Michael because we felt bad for him. We didn't want him on the streets. We knew the life that he grew up with as well. And we're like, I felt bad and so did she. At one point, he's just like, no, just leave him. He's fine. He's a man. He'll get back up on his own two feet. I'm like, yeah, but it's still not right. Like, he was there for us um, during everything, suicide attempt and on. He was the one person that he wound up helping us out tremendously, and he never hung around mainly or anyone. Were you addicted to any drugs? At the time, I was only addicted to marijuana. Only marijuana. And I wound up quitting. I call it a drug because no matter what, for me, that was a drug. Um, at the time, though, I wound up quitting cold turkey. I was like, nope, I'm not doing this. So it takes a strong character uh, to leave a lifestyle like that and to get where you are today. Obviously... Uh, your story uh, of definitely of a near-death experience that uh, put you in a different direction where you saw your guardian angel. Uh, you, you had, uh, you know, moments where, you know, you were told by your guardian angel that you have to move on with life. It is not your time yet. You know, un- unfortunately, there's so many stories like yourself where they don't get that second chance. They die yeah. at suicide um, over overdoses, over drugs, over, over different things. So you have a second chance now in life. And I understand you're going in a new direction now. I feel you have like a I'm three-year-old a, child, actually. Correct? Yeah, I feel like I'm a cat. I've had about a few, uh, n- not near-death experiences, but a few uh, 
chances to get my life back. Um, but the biggest chance that I took was leaving that. It wasn't a risk. It was a chance. And I'm glad I wound up not going back to that lifestyle. And now you're living with your father? Yeah, I'm living with my parents. With your parents. And you have a three-year-old child now, correct? Mm -hmm. And your three-year-old has inspirations of being uh, She wants a to be firefighter. a firefighter. Yeah. And what brought her into uh, to that? Honestly, I, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. I know that when she, when I was pregnant, um, my mom and I, even to this day, even though we don't get along, it's kind of like oil and water with her and I, but, um, at the same time I can come to her and tell her, look, you're right. I was wrong. I'm sorry. But when I was pregnant, I was sitting down watching Chicago fire. And, um, it was at the time that NBC had the back to back, the lineup, Chicago med, Chicago fire and Chicago PD. Well, we wound up watching Chicago Med, and I know that moms and babies have a connection. And I don't know, for some reason, I just kind of wound up asking her just internally, so is that something you want to do? She's like, no, you want to be a police officer, not me. And so then, it sounds crazy, I know, but um, it's like we had this bond even while she was in my belly. And so I kind of rolled my eyes. I'm like, oh, that's true. I do want to be a I do want to be a police officer and some type of law enforcement. And then um, Chicago Fire came on. And when I tell you if my child could have ripped herself out of my stomach at that time just to watch that TV show, yeah. I felt her head turning, her whole body turning, everything. Just And trying to like listen full on to the show. And what's your daughter's name? Mackenzie. Oh, Mackenzie, that's that's nice. So, so I understand also your your mom actually works uh, with Jesse's mom in a in a hospital, and uh, you were actually sitting back watching TV, and you see Molly come out on TV with this crazy story of how she was victim number one, how she was yeah. molested, and your reaction to that. I was honestly enraged. I was. It brought back a lot of memories, good and bad. Good meaning the way that I got out, the things that I did, just a lot of things that I'm proud of myself for. But then it also brought back a lot of bad. And then when I had seen that, who she was accusing, because personally to me, I don't care if it was Jesse, I don't care if it's another police officer that I don't know. Just the fact that she was accusing a police officer, I knew for a fact. And then seeing Jesse... And seeing the name, I'm like, he's not capable of doing this. I know within my gut, I have made bad choices. But when I have a gut feeling, I tend to stick to it because I'm never wrong about it. And I know, Jesse, he is not capable of it. Not capable whatsoever. When you say you know Jesse, you met him through uh, his mom? I used to hang out with him when I was a kid. Oh, when you were a kid. How old? I was about, I think, six or so. Okay, okay, so it was something back then in the neighborhood, yeah. and the moms stayed together, friends, and then you kind of yeah, lost worked, touch, and you see this on Yeah, the news. they worked together for many, many years. Um, Jesse and I never went to school together. We never hung out to where I was really close, and I knew his clo um, close-knit group, but I knew his family. I knew how they were, and I knew growing up, when he would do something wrong, they would reprimand him. They wouldn't just let it slide. And they were... Possibly some things they could have just let slide, but it's, you know, it's parenting. Sure. So um, I knew, though, for some reason that when it came to Maylee, she is the type that she will say and do whatever she wants to get her way. She will lie. She will throw people under the bus. She'll do whatever she has to do to save her own skin, not realizing the damage that it causes. And it. I'd like to say you're putting yourself into something that you caused the problems of. Basically, it's her fault for this going on. I hate to say it because I don't like blaming anyone, but it is her fault that all of this has, has happened and then blaming somebody else for it. I, I don't agree with it. I know, again, gut feeling, Jesse is not capable, 100% not capable of doing it. Yeah, our phones blew up that day when they came out on TV, and part of that was was from you when you saw that on uh, television. You got a hold of your mom. Your mom started making contacting, and you says, 
this girl is out of her mind. You know her lifestyle, and that's when you want it to come on our show. It's it's just uh, you know a fascinating story on on your side with that. I mean, I wasn't deep into the lifestyle that she was, but I knew for a fact that for some reason I just got this this like I guess you can say a reading on her. Um, and I read deep into her and how she is and just what her daily go abouts were. And I didn't like it. I saw her on the news and the first flashback that it brought was the day that she tried to fight me. And I was just chilling on the sofa, enjoying TV. And she was actually not even enjoying TV. I was on my phone listening to, um, to my headsets at the time. And she came up. I don't know if she was on drugs, drinking, or what. But she started just pushing me around, like literally. Oh, so you got this to say? You got that to say? You don't like it here? You don't like this? Going off. Kept pushing me and slapping me. And I'm like, Maylee, do not touch me. I am not the one. I have kept my calm. I've been controlled. I've been very decent. One thing I know, and one thing that I've told you many times, do not touch me. Do not get in my face. So you are 100% sure that Jesse Manicol did not commit these A hundred percent sure. Because all these people that are brought into it, I guarantee you, Maley knows them in some way or another. Well, just so you know and our, our viewers are aware, uh, Molly DaCosta's case was one of them that was dropped. And it wasn't uh, any case that uh, Jesse pleaded out to during this uh, this complete uh, investigation uh, with the with the feds. But the unique thing is the how they would even allow her to go up at the sentencing hearing and tell her preposterous story without even being a victim. She's calling herself victim number one in front of the media as well. And she's going out there explaining her story that finally justice was served. Does she even realize that her case was dropped? I honestly don't know. I don't speak to her. I basically cut ties with her when I left. She, I'd like to say, is dead to me. Um, I do know, however, that Nicole and her, Nicole used to take me aside and tell me, you know, I have a degree in psychology. So I know when you're lying. I'm like, that's great. You can you can talk to me and think that I'm lying, but I'm not. I have nothing to hide. I'll tell you honestly what I did, where I did, when I did it. I don't care. And that's the one thing that I know that um, Nicole was always like, okay, yeah. Like she she would always go like this too. Like stroking, um, stroking her neck. Okay, you know what? I do believe you. And she would try to see and she's like, but there's something about you. you're lying about something. I'm like, no, no, no. If I'm lying about something, best to believe it's probably your conscience because I don't lie. I was well, raised well, we, not to. We certainly appreciate you clearing your conscience, uh, facing your demons, and uh, moving on in a new direction in life. And we certainly thank you for having the courage to come on our show and talk about the, uh, your past and talk about the lifestyle uh, style of one of these accusers. And uh, we would like to have you back in the near future. And we thank you and wish you the very best. Thank you. Are you a fan of our show? Do you like our show? Then comment, hit the like button, and subscribe. Or you might be the next one we investigate.